the, the, what we're going to look at, you've heard before. It's, in fact, if you've attended church for very long, there's probably rarely that you hear something new. You, you've pretty much heard everything. The scriptures communicate to us consistently over and over the primary truths that God wants us to know about himself. So this is not going to be anything new. But that doesn't mean it's not important. And I, I am always concerned that we go, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, I kind of I got where we're going. I've got it. So I'm really praying the Lord will use this in all of our lives to, again, bring us to recenter ourselves on him. So my question is this. How have you changed over the last few years? So I've given you, all of us, big swaths of time. Few years. So how have you changed? Now, immediately, probably you thought about how you have less hair and more belly or something like that. So, yes, physical changes. So let's narrow that down. How have you changed in your Christ-likeness, in being like Jesus over the last few years? Now, I'm not talking about over the last week because change is slow, and we change incrementally once we become adults. So change is slow. So give yourselves, again, big swaths of time. How have you changed in Christ's likeness? And now let's narrow that down. Let's think of some specific ways that you have seen God change you. And you may go, but that, that's so vague, Christ's likeness. So let's consider the fruit of the Spirit of Galatians 5.22. And that's a, good, that, that's a good way. When we think about Christ's likeness, that's a good passage to turn to. So the fruit of the Spirit in our lives is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. So those are nine characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit working in our life. It's one fruit. As the Spirit works in us, it comes out. In those ways. So when you're thinking about how has the Lord really changed me? How am I growing specifically in love and in joy and in peace and in patience? And you go through that list. So how has the Lord changed you? Now, got to be fair here. It would be easy for me to say, oh, I'm much more patient. Like I used to walk around the house much more aggravated than I am now. I've grown in patience. But the truth is... Two of our three children have moved out. So the irritants that tested my patients, and I love them dearly, they're no longer there. So it would be easy for me to say, well, I've grown in patience, when the truth is I've, my circumstances have changed where I'm not being exposed to what tested my patients. So let's go with something that has consistently tested all of our patients. Highway 98. That has been a consistent irritant. How have you grown in patience? So that's the way I want you to be thinking. Real quick, quick survey, ask the Holy Spirit. Just show me, uh, just generally, how have I been changed into Christ's likeness? So the, the two points of today's sermon are this. That God is changing us. God is changing us, and God will change us. That, that would be the first thing I want us to see. And number two, that God uses the church as a primary tool, as one of the primary tools in changing us to be conformed to the image of Christ. Now, you've heard us use that phrase regularly, this being conformed to the image of Christ. Well, that comes from Romans 8, and it... It's the end of Romans 8, Romans 8, uh, 28 through 30, and that's called the golden chain. So if you ever hear anybody refer to the golden chain in Scripture, this is that passage in that chain there. I want us to read it and see what the Lord is doing. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew... He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. 
And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. So you see in there, in verse 29, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. So God has predestined those in Christ to be conformed to the image of his Son. So if you're here and you know Christ, and you belong to Him, then it is a settled fact that you will be conformed to the image of His Son. In fact, Paul will write that when we see Him face to face, we will be changed and be made like Him. So there is the ultimate, whether when we die and see Him or He returns and we see Him, when we are in His presence, we will be changed into His image. So that is a fact it is a done deal but God is not waiting until then to change us God is changing us now he has begun the process of changing us that he will complete when we see him but he's begun the process of changing us so we are being changed into the image of his son that means then we are changing Because God is changing us. So we go back to our question. How has God changed you? Because if you belong to God, he is working in you to change you into his image. And you go, well, that's so vague. You again return to Galatians 22. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. How is God changing me in these specific areas? And then the second point is, is he uses the church as a primary tool. As one of the main tools to conform us into his image, he has placed us in the church. This is why being a member and a part of a church is so important. Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. And he gave the apostles the prophets, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints For the work of ministry, for our building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, By human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head. Into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Do you see how then in that passage the Lord uses the body? He gave the bodies, he gave the church leaders, and the, the purpose of those leaders is to equip the church in doing ministry. So the job of leadership in the church is to equip the church to do ministry. I know it's gotten flipped in some churches where they go, no, no, your job is to do the ministry, and our job is to make sure you do the ministry. But the, the way God has it organized is that God gave leaders to the church to lead the church and equip the church to do ministry. And did you notice what that ministry is? That ministry is so that the church itself is built up into maturity until everyone in the church reaches maturity. He says there in verse 24... Or or verse 13, I don't know what I'm looking at. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And what is mature manhood there? It is the measure of Christ. So Romans tells us we're being conformed to the image of Christ. In fact, we're predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. And then we find other passages like the Ephesian passage that says, and we are doing that now together. 
that the Lord has given us the church so that we do that together. The church is the primary tool that God uses to change us into and to conform us to the image of Christ. Or it is a primary tool to conform us to the image of Christ. So now I want us to look at our passage in Acts. And I want us to see how God is working in the lives of even leaders. Acts 18, we're going to look at that verses 18 through 28. And then we're going to also look at uh, Acts 19, 1 through 10. After this, Paul stayed many days longer and then took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria and with him Priscilla and Aquila. At Sincrae, he had cut his hair for he was under a vow. And they came to Ephesus and he left them there. But he himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay for a longer period, he declined. But on taking leave of them, he said, I will return to you if God wills. And he set sail from Ephesus. When he had landed at Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church and then went down to Antioch. And after spending some time there, he departed and went from one place to the next through the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. So Luke Remember, this is the pattern of Acts. He gives a summary, kind of a general, here's what all happened. And then afterwards, he gives an anecdote from that summary of something important that he wants us to know. So this is the summary. And this summary actually is extensive and covers probably over a year of time. So here is what happened. Remember, when we left Paul, he was in Corinth. Corinth is in Greece. So if you imagine Greece, you know, you, the little fingers and all that. So Corinth is there. Just south of Corinth is Sincrae, which is just kind of a, it's a suburb of Corinth and it's the port suburb, suburb. So they go there and there Paul cuts his hair because he made a vow. That's all Luke tells us. Then he travels across and he goes to Asia Minor. And on the western coast, southwestern coast of Asia Minor, is Ephesus. They go there and then from Ephesus, they're going to travel all the way down to Caesarea, which is the port you would use to go over to Jerusalem. He reports to the church Jerusalem. Then Luke says they went down to Antioch. Well, Antioch is north, but in elevation, Jerusalem is higher. So in their mind, they're going down. So they go down to Antioch, and then from Antioch, he, he begins his third missionary journey back into Asia Minor, Galatia, and Phrygia. And he eventually is going to go all the way over to Asia Minor, back to the west coast, to Ephesus. So Paul, Luke gives us this big summary, like end of the second missionary journey, beginning of the third. And he just makes one point in all of that. At Sincrae, Paul cut his hair. And here's the reason. He was under a vow. Now that raises a lot of questions. What was the vow? What kind of vow do you have to be under to cut your hair? Was it right or wrong for Paul to be under a vow? And by the way, that is a debate. There are some theologians and some pastors who have preached strongly that Paul was absolutely in sin to make a vow to the Lord. That that was part of Paul's old Judaic um, mindset and that Paul had not yet got to the point of understanding that he should not have done that. And they use some different scriptures. I don't find it that convincing, but they feel strongly about that. There is debate. Was Paul wrong to have made the vow or not? And my point would, or my point to you is, I don't think that that, that's not the point I want us to dwell on. Maybe he was, maybe he wasn't. I don't know. I, find, I don't find a lot of evidence that would cause me to condemn him. But you need to know there is controversy about that. But what I see is this. It's easy for us to look at Paul and go, man, Paul has become 
the primary face or becoming, maybe he's not quite there yet, but he's becoming the primary face of the church. Man, he is the one whose letters are slowly being spread. He's only written a couple up to this point. But his letters are already being circulated. He's the great theologian. He's had more training than any of them. He's the guy. And it's easy for us then to go, well, someone who is a theologian like that and has worked out all of their thoughts and their, their view and all of this and, you know, and their teaching, then they have it. They've got it. And yeah, nobody's perfect and there's some, you know, but they've got it. And it's easier for us to forget Paul was also a man in a personal relationship with God. He also was in a personal relationship with God. There wasn't just, so there is Paul, the public preacher and the writer and the theologian, but then there's also the Paul called by God, saved by God, walking with God. And that Paul was growing. He was, to use the term that I think is, seems like it's popular nowadays. It may have always been popular and I didn't know it. But Paul was in process. He was in the process of being conformed to the image of God. And so whatever that process was, he had, his, he had a personal walk with God that at some point Paul made a vow to the Lord. And at some point in that vow, it required him to cut his hair. So the lesson of this verse is, cut your hair. No. I don't know what that means, except for what I want us to see is, is, so the same thing that was true of me is true of Paul, that the Lord was conforming him into the image of his son, and Paul had a personal walk with God that affected Paul, that wasn't just about the church and about ministry, it was about Paul walking with the Lord, because All of us are being conformed to the image of his son. And whatever that meant, and whether Paul was right or wrong, to me is not that important. To me, I just read it and go, yeah, Paul, maybe Luke, and I'm just spitballing here. I don't know. So everything I'm about to say, you clearly know. I'm just like, maybe. So maybe Luke said, oh, man, that's an awful haircut. And Paul went, oh, is a vow to the Lord? And Luke, oh, I'll put it in there. Because people who know you are going to go, how oh, what did he do to his head? I'll, you know, I'll, I'll cover you, Paul. I don't think that happened. But maybe, maybe later on, in ways we don't know, Paul came back and went, hey, guys, in your zeal for the Lord at times, you're just going to say things and make promises, and you need to keep them, but... How about you just not do that? Maybe he's going to do that. I don't know. Because I, I, I've, I've read this passage going, why is that important? Why is it important that Paul cut his hair because he made a vow? I don't know. But it does encourage me, right or wrong, Paul was in personal relationship with God, being conformed to the image of Christ. Then Paul goes to Ephesus, verse 24. So he he left Corinth. He had to sell across. So he was in Greek. He sells across, and he lands in Ephesus. Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the Scriptures, He had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he wished to cross to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples uh, to welcome him. When he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had had believed. For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Christ was Jesus. 
So Apollos was an eloquent, powerful teacher. He was a powerful debater and defender of the scriptures. And the verses even tell us here that he spoke accurately. Verse 25, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus. So it would be easy then when we hear a powerful speaker and we hear someone who is defending and debating the scriptures with the Jews and doing it with power and with eloquence. It's easy then for us to go, oh yeah, this guy has arrived. But Priscilla and Aquila had lived with Paul for a while. And I'm sure they sat around the table and had lots of discussions. Or maybe while they were doing their work, making tents, they, they would get into discussions. But when they heard Apollo speak, it's not that he said anything wrong. The scripture's clear here. He spoke accurately concerning Jesus. So they, they saw the power. They saw the eloquence. They saw this is, you know, they, they would have seen a man who defended himself and the truth of God well. And yet they heard and saw that there was still more for him. So what did they do? They took him aside, verse 26, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Apollos, what you're saying is true, but there's more here. There are things about Jesus you don't know. And so they encouraged him and they taught him so that at the end, Apollos was even more accurate about God. Now, I find that encouraging. I think that is phenomenal because it is easy for us to look at the great preachers and teachers that we love and to watch their pod or to listen to their podcast or watch videos of them and even you know download their teaching series and you know it's like oh this person has so influenced me and it's easy to think they have arrived but the truth is we are all being conformed to the image of his son we are all growing. And here Apollos, who publicly, the Jews had a hard time refuting him wherever he went as he defended the scriptures. And yet there was still more for him to know so that he could know God more accurately. And how was it that God worked in his life that he could know that? God used the church, Priscilla and Aquila. And he was humble enough to receive it and they were humble enough to give it. And you go, well, how were they humble? They pulled him aside. We don't need to embarrass him. We don't need to show out that we know more than you. The Lord is using you here. We think we can help. Because God is always changing us. And the primary way God does it, or one of the primary ways God does it, is through the church. Apollos, is, he, he gets permission to go to Achaia, so here's what's happening. So Apollos was in Ephesus. I don't know how long he was there, but he was uh, part of why he was there. Priscilla and Aquila explained to him more accurately truth of God. He asked permission to go over to Greece. So Apollos is going to end up in Corinth. So we started this with Paul in Corinth going to Ephesus and then going down to Jerusalem and then up to Antioch and then he's coming back to Asia Minor. Apollos is then, so he's left Ephesus. Apollos comes to Ephesus. Priscilla and Aquila are teaching. Apollos is ministering there. Then he asks if he can go, and he's going to then go end up in Corinth. So Apollos and Paul are missing each other. So Paul now comes back across Asia Minor, and he's going to end up in Ephesus. Verse 1. Of chapter 19. And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. 
There he found some disciples. Now, the disciples are most likely, all the evidence suggests they are disciples of Apollos, that they heard Apollos preaching and that they had become believers under Apollos, and you'll see why in a minute. And uh, he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what then were you baptized? They said, into John's baptism. Remember the verses before said that Apollos knew only John's baptism. So it makes sense then. That's what I know. Here's accurate truth about Jesus as far as, you know, up to what I know. And all I know is John's baptism. So they received John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him. That is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So in other words, fill in the blanks here, that Jesus has come and there's a baptism. Anyway, um, and when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. There were about 12, of, 12 men in all. So um, we've talked about this before. This is not a verse, as it is often used. I disagree with the use of this verse that would say, oh, see, this means there's always more. You receive Jesus, and then there's more later, and you receive the Holy Spirit. Remember, the purview of the Holy Spirit in the early church belonged to the apostles so that the church would stay unified. Remember how I told you Apollos and Paul are missing each other? Priscilla and Aquila are not apostles. It is through Paul then that the Holy Spirit comes to affirm that Apollos and his disciples, those who receive the Holy Spirit, are part of the church, are part of the unity. This isn't, so in other words, it's not the missionaries, the, these apostles go out and then they find a tribe or a group of people and go, oh, hey, yeah, y'all, are, y'all are also believers. We didn't know anything about you. Now there's like two churches going on here or something like that. It is to keep the unity of the faith in the early church. The Holy Spirit is given through those leaders to keep the unity. So they receive. So notice they have the humility to know there's more. And they are growing. And they know that through the church. Through another believer. In verse 8, and he entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus, This continued for two years so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. Paul actually ends up staying in Ephesus about three years total when you add it all together. Staying and pastoring those people, discipling them so that, and remember Asia is one of the provinces in Asia Minor. They're not talking about Asia like India, that area. And if Ephesus was in Asia, and Paul is teaching and discipling there, helping the church to grow. So again, we have God is conforming all of us, even these here, into the image of his son, and God is using the church, other believers, to do that. Because that's how God works. So since we are all growing, how are you changing to be like Christ? Knowledge is not maturity. Maturity may require knowledge, but knowledge is not maturity. As an example, I know a lot about healthy eating. 
I know a lot about exercise. I could talk to you a lot about that. I could talk to you a lot about the benefits of intermittent fasting. I've read a lot of that stuff. But have you looked at me? If knowledge was maturity, then we're in trouble. Maturity in any area is the acting on the knowledge. It comes out, it changes who we are so that we act differently. So we can know all about Jesus. We can know all about theology. We can, ham- we can have hammered out our theology to such a degree that we, have all- we are always ready to give an answer, which we are called to do. However, we would be mistaken if we said that automatically meant maturity. Maturity is what we live out. So the fruit of the Spirit, as Paul is giving us these characteristics of the fruit, he doesn't say knowledge. He says love. That is something that comes out of us, that is in us and it comes out of us. Because the Lord has so worked in us that we find in our hearts love and we extend love. Joy. We don't just know about joy. It's something we find in us and it comes out of us. Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. All of these things are things that are changes in us and these changes in us then come out of us. That is maturity. Maturity is not that I know about those things. Maturity is that those that whatever knowledge I have, the work of God in me, that I am actually being conformed to the image of God. So the more I walk with God, the more those things should be coming out of me. Now, I've joked a lot, and I will continue to joke a lot, about being a crotchety old man. Because I'm headed that way if the Spirit does not intervene in significant ways. But here's the truth. If I am genuinely a crotchety old man, then somebody needs to question my salvation. To have walked with God that long and for love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, not to have come out in more ways than when I was younger is to question, have I been walking with God? Because the Lord is conforming me to the image of his son and he began as soon as I received Christ and he hasn't stopped. So at some point I have begun to resist the Lord. Right? I want to go back to Romans 8. I don't want to spend, I don't want to get into it too much because we're going to, after Acts, we're going to go through Romans. And I am really excited about that. We may be in Romans till I die. And I, I will be perfectly, that's the one book. Normally about halfway through a book, Andy's going, I start getting antsy. He's, I'm like, oh, I'm ready for something else. And he's like, we're going to be preaching God's word every week, like, just because the title is Acts at top. And I'm like, I don't care. I mean, this book's awesome. Um, but Romans, man, that's going to be a book where I'm like, ah, oh, we're going too fast. It's like we've only spent 12 weeks on this word here, you know, like too, too fast. Because Romans is amazing. But I do want to talk about that Romans 8 verse. Because he says there in the golden chain, he says for, and we are familiar with verse 28. For we know uh, that God works good or that all things work for the good of those who love God. And are called according to his purpose. What's interesting, and I'm going to try not to get too far ahead of myself. But what's interesting about that is, is right before that, Paul is talking about the Spirit intervening for us in prayer. That we don't know what to pray. So the Spirit intervenes with groanings. And the Spirit is praying God's will. For us. So we have God interceding to God the way we should be praying when we are walking and the Holy Spirit is perfectly in control. 
So you think about your prayers when, the Holy, when you are walking by the Spirit, when the Holy Spirit has you and you are yielded to the Holy Spirit versus your prayers when you are not. My prayers when I am not fully yielded to the Holy Spirit in that moment, sometimes it's because I'm just, I'll just hurry up and get this over with, I'm you know, sleepy or whatever. Um, they, they, can really, they can really go down a road that's very what I want. But those times of prayer, when the Spirit is really coming out of me, what comes out, and you've been there, so what I'm, you may use different words, but you've experienced this. You know what I'm saying, even if I don't use the exact words you would, is your prayers are, Lord, I want so badly that you glorify your name in my life. And I want, Lord, to walk with you and to know you. And I want to know you better. And I want to know you deeper, Lord. And I want, at the end of this life, I want to hear you say, well done. Not because I did a lot for you, but simply because I was submitted and you worked through me. And what you do is good. So that's the spirit in control. And then most of the time it's, Hey, Lord, it's kind of cloudy, and I really want the sun to come out. So, could you those sun clouds out of the way? You know, just benign things like that at times, or banal things. Banal, I think is the word. Things like that. Now, imagine the Holy Spirit in us constantly praying, interceding for us. Those first kind of prayers all the time. The kind of prayers that we would pray ourselves when the Holy Spirit is in control. And he's always praying that for us. And then we come to and we know all things work out for the good. So if the Lord answers his prayers to himself on our behalf, if that made sense. So then we come to... When we receive bad news. So uh, I'll use my eyes as an example. Though I'm, I'm, I, I just believe that Lord's grace so far is so good. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I may, I may never go blind. The Lord is that powerful. Who knows what the Lord's going to do. But what I've had to do is visiting those passages and going, Lord, when you are in control, I want, I want to be conformed to your image. And I want your name to be glorified. If this is an answer, because you've continued to pray this for me to yourself. If this is an answer so that you go, I will be glorified in this way. And I will conform you more to my image in this way. How could I ever call that anything but good? Now you think of your situations. Because many of you are in much worse situations. How often maybe what the Lord is answering, what's happening is the Lord's going, I heard my prayers on your behalf that you would be conformed to my image and I am doing good to answer that very thing so that you are conformed to my image. Because what I am going to bring out in you is love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Now, I'm not going to wait until you see me. I'm going to begin to work at that in you now. And that is good. And because it's hard, I am going to bring along people in your life that will encourage you. To be conformed to my image. So I read this passage. And whenever we come to a passage. There's two questions I always ask. What does this teach me about God? And then what does this teach me about walking with God? I left this passage going. Lord there's a lot about this passage. Particularly the vow thing. And the Holy Spirit thing. That I think I'm right but on that. But. Lord, there's a lot about this passage that I don't know that I can definitively say is true. But what I can say is true is this. You are conforming all of these people into the image of your son. They all are walking with you. And you are bringing into their lives people who are you are using to help them be conformed to your image. And that is true with us. That is true with us. So are you growing in the Lord? 
Are you being conformed to the image of Christ? Yes, you are if you're in Christ. So then, are you participating with God in what he's doing? Are you participating? Are you exposing yourself to God and his word? Are you exposing yourself to his people? Are you participating with his people? I will find people that will go, oh, I'm just so fed up with the church and it's not what it should be. And I'm like, yes, that's kind of the way it's always going to be. Because the Ephesians verse tells us that we are joined together until all of us reach maturity. Do you know what that means? That means most of us are not mature. So we are involved in each other's life. You've got people who are all maturing, and we're involved in each other's lives for the purpose of encouraging each other. But since no one has arrived, no one does it perfectly. But the Lord is working in all of us, and the worst thing we can do is say, well, because because those people haven't arrived yet, then I'm going to pull myself away and not be a part of them. And I would just say, according to what I see in Scripture, you have chosen not to participate with God in what He's doing in your life. Because the thing I see in Scripture over and over and over again is this. The, one of the primary tools God uses in conforming us to the image of His Son is the church. And we see here, even in this passage, people involved with people. So here's what that means. So am I participating in God? Am I exposing myself to be taught and encouraged by others in the body? Am I helping others in the body to grow in Christ? The way we do that here primarily Live Oak is life groups. This is good, and we try to be faithful here. But the whole thing about life groups is, is you build relationships. And every life group is not going to be this major thing. But what happens is, is there are these friendships that are growing. And as you are praying and opening yourself to others, and you're praying the Lord will use you and others, there may come a point where in a conversation you go, hey, what if we had lunch together? I'd love to talk to you more about that. And from that, you grow from their perspective on something, or you encourage them. Are you doing that? Are you participating in what the Lord is doing and conforming you to the image of His Son? By not only being in the Word and exposing yourself to the Lord in that way and exposing yourself to God. And one other thing about that is, is in your prayer life or at some point, are you being very honest with God about who you are? Including, Lord, show me all the ways I'm not like you. Like, Lord, I know I'm not like you. And I'll just give a platitude, oh, yeah, I'm not like Jesus. But honestly go in and say, Lord, I'm not like you. How, how in this year? Would you work? How now would you work to begin to change me to be like you? Show me, God. Are you exposing yourself in those ways? Or are you protecting yourself even from God? Now think about what I just said or ask. What I'm talking about is a vulnerability to the Lord. To say, I understand that I need to grow and change. And are you protecting yourself even from intimacy with the Lord? To make yourself open to the Lord. To say, change me, conform me to your image. Which means I need to change in some way. So here's some encouraging things. Number one. You're never going to get there. So you always have something, a purpose. Now you say, how's that encouraging? Well, we're being conformed to the image of the infinitely deep God. We're never going to get there. So, you know, some people retire and they go, oh, I've retired. I don't have a whole lot to do. Well, you got being conformed to the image of God. How about getting up and working on that one? You always have something to do. 
Number two, you're never alone in this process. You have the Holy Spirit who is interceding for you constantly. The will of God. Always praying the will of God to God himself. Always praying. God's praying for you to himself. Guys, my head will explode if we try to wrap our mind around the Trinity. Just go with it. And you have other believers. They're imperfect. So here's what that means. You should give them grace. And they should give you grace. There are times at the house I may get a little aggravated. Um, and I will often think, how often have I needed grace from them? How often have I needed them to give me grace? A lot. I need to give them grace. They've given me a lot of grace. I need to give them grace. Now take that and expand it to the church. How often have you guys had to give me grace? And if you've been going here very long, a lot. I have failed you. I've been imperfect in some way. I've misspoke at times. I've, done, I've said something I thought was funny, and you went, I can't believe that. And you were offended, and you just walked away quietly. And I needed you to give me grace because I am not yet in the image of God, and you need me to give you grace because you are not yet in the image of God. But we have to work together to attain maturity. Now, sometimes that working together means people have to say hard things to each other. And we have to be willing to do that. But we look at Priscilla and Aquila and we pull aside and it's private. If Paul didn't, if Luke didn't write that they pulled him aside, we would never know it. With the goal being God has put us together to encourage each other as part of the process of what God is doing in us. I think God's church is beautiful, even though it's very imperfect. Because it is a primary tool God uses to conform us to the image of his son. Let's be a part of what God is doing there. Let's pray. Great God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your goodness. I am absolutely blown away, blown away by how generous and good and kind you are to us. Thank you. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen.